Amen. All right, will you all go down to your classrooms? Learn about Jesus today. So, question for you as we get started today. Uh, how many people here have a Christmas tree during the Christmas season? A Christmas tree? Uh, I think that's almost everybody. Did anyone not raise their hand? Raise your hand if you did not raise your hand. <laughs> what do you do? We got a different tree. You got a different tree. We got a stocking tree. A stocking tree. For all of our kids and grandkids. Okay. All your kids and grandkids. Was that thing like 35 feet tall? Yeah. <laughs> I, I bet it is. Well, on your Christmas tree, here's the question. What do you put on top of your tree? Do you put a star on top of the tree? Do you put an angel on top of your tree? Does your family have some other sort of a tree topper? Or do you put nothing on top of your tree? How, how many of you how many put an angel up on top of the tree? You have an angel? A few people with angels on top of the tree? Okay. How many do a star on top of the tree? Some have a star on top of the tree? How many have some other thing on top of the tree? Something else? What would be other than? A lo oh, lollipops. Lollipops atop the tree. Okay, I've never heard that one. Uh, is there something else? Anything else that people do on top of their tree? What do you guys do? A Santa Claus hat up on top of the tree. Okay. Is there anybody who just simply goes with the tree itself? You have nothing atop your tree. Okay. A couple people with just nothing up on top of the tree. A lot of us will put things on top of our tree, and a lot of us will put a star on top of the tree. And the star is representative, of course, of something because we read in the scripture uh, about the Christmas star. Uh, although the scripture doesn't call it the Christmas star, scripture calls it his star. And last week we began our, our Christmas series this year, which is called Be a Star. We're looking for ways in which we can be like the star that we read about in Matthew chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to Matthew chapter 2. Uh, we read this passage last week. We'll be reflecting on it from a different perspective yet again today. And while you're turning there, I wanted to share something. Um, usually, and by the way, this year I'm about a week late. Usually the first Sunday in December... Uh, I just get super excited. We have just moved past Thanksgiving, which at least for me ushers in the Christmas season. I know for some people that starts right after Halloween's over, uh, but for me it's, it's after Thanksgiving ends, we move into the Christmas season. Uh, you come into the sanctuary and you see that we have teams of people who, who put together these beautiful decorations. We start to see things out in the community. A lot of our houses start to, to be decorated a certain way for Christmas. And, and usually I'm just so pumped for Christmas. And all my life I've been just a, a lover of Christmas. And so usually that first Sunday I'll come in and just talk about how excited I am for Christmas. And this year I've, I've really pressed myself to ask, what is it about Christmas that I love so much? I mean, what do I really get so excited about? What is it that, that stirs my heart and makes me experience so much joy uh, during the Christmas season? At least, usually. And, and some of it is the music. Uh, un unlike some Scrooges, I love Christmas music. I think Christmas music is awesome. And I'm not just talking about Here Comes Santa, Frosty the Snowman, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. In fact, somebody this morning said, hey, what's your favorite Christmas song? And without, without even thinking, Oh Holy Night. I love the song, Oh Holy Night. And there's a very close second for me, and it's called um, Christmas Offering. We bring an offering to you, Jesus. And, and so I love Christmas music. I also love the, the decorations and the lights. There's no doubt about it. I love those things. Uh, anybody who knows me will tell you I love presents. I love presents. I love receiving presents. I'm not going to lie. I do love receiving presents. But I also love giving presents. And those are some of the commercial things. And as Sean talked about, listen, you'll, you'll go to churches all over the country. And I'm not just saying that this is misguided. Uh, it is certainly necessary for us to preach messages on uh, remembering that Jesus is, Jesus is the reason for the season and how we have to keep our focus and all that kind of stuff. And we can become distracted. And look, those things are real. Those things are true. They are. But there are also some great things about Christmas. 
I, I've been very lucky that in my family, um, my family is, is really close, even extended family. Uh, aunts and uncles, and I have many. I have many aunts and uncles, and I have many cousins. And over all the years, uh, we've just remained fairly close. And at Christmas, we come together, and we have uh, Christmas Eve with one side of the family, and then Christmas Eve with the other side of the family. And now that I'm married, we have Christmas Day with, with my wife's family. And, and so there's a closeness, and people come together, and, and I've just always really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the stories and how the stories get exaggerated and, and blown up over the years. I, I enjoy the, just the laughter and the camaraderie. I enjoy those things, and those are good things. Outside of just family, I enjoy that there, there's something different in communities. And I know there's the rat race and the hustle and bustle and all that kind of stuff, but there is still just something different. There, there, there's a, a, a general uh, uh, warmth and, and, and maybe a different kind of joy and hope, I guess. Uh, maybe a little different kind of kindness and generosity. And I know it's not everywhere and it's not everyone, but there is just something a little different about the season, and I enjoy that. And that's a good thing. I enjoy rest. A lot of us uh, have schedules where during Christmas we, we get to have a little bit of a rest, whether we're students or whether we're teachers or, or whether we have other kinds of jobs. There's usually uh, some part of the Christmas holiday where we get a day or two off and, and we get to have a little bit of rest. And I know we can become busy with lots of other things too, but, but there is something built in for, for rest. And as I said, those are good things, and, and we could go on with that list. And so enjoying Christmas in and of itself is really not a bad thing. There are many good things. But what are we celebrating? What are we remembering? And I will just confess to you today that while I know something in my head, sometimes the 18 inches between my brain and my heart seems like, a thousand miles. And while I know that this is a time to remember that God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that when the time was just right, God sent Jesus, born of a woman. I know that's what it's about, but to really embrace that and soak that in. And, and I just want to take a minute here. Just a, a minute. And maybe you've already done this. Maybe you're already there. Maybe I'm just behind all the rest of you. But I want to take just a minute and, and allow you to ponder that for a minute. Whether it's with your eyes open, your eyes closed, whatever that is, I want you to stop and think for a moment that every single one of us here is a sinner. And if you think you're not, you're just confused. We're all sinners. Our Father in Heaven is absolutely perfect in every way. And because we are sinners, we cannot, by ourselves, have a relationship with Him. And whether people like this or not, whether people want to argue this or not, whether people want to say that it's too harsh, too rough, too whatever, every one of us here deserves hell. It's what I deserve. Eternal separation from my perfect Father in heaven. But our Father loves us too much. And He wanted to restore the relationship we have with Him. He wanted to make that relationship right because you and I couldn't do it. He wanted to make that relationship right. And in order to do so, he had to do the work. And so God literally became a human being. He became a baby in the person of Jesus Christ, born to a virgin in a miraculous birth. And the whole purpose of Jesus' life was to be an example and ultimately to die for you and me. And we're not sure when that happened. We don't know if it happened in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. We're not exactly sure when it happened. The only thing we are sure of is that it happened. And it happened at just the right time. In fact, I don't have this in my notes today, but as long as we're talking about it, go to Galatians 4. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 4. 
We're going to go to Galatians 4. You know why we're going there? Because God's Word is so powerful. Galatians 4. Verses 4 and 5, I think it is. But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His very own children. And because we are His children, God has sent his, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are His child, God has made you His heir. I have this sense right now that maybe we're supposed to spend some time here. And I don't have anything prepared and it's not in my notes, but um, I'm going to run with that if that's okay. When the right time came, God sent His Son born of a woman. We don't fully understand this. We take it on faith, but we, we know that Jesus... That the, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that Jesus Christ, who was with God and was always with God and existed in all time and was absolutely perfect in every way, was being glorified in every way, was given a mission. The Father said, I'm going to send you into the world and I'm going to make you human. This idea that born of a woman is really important. And it's why Hebrews says that, that Jesus is our perfect high priest. Let me explain that for just a minute if I can. Because while Jesus is fully God and he understands everything that there is to be God, he also wanted to understand everything that there is to be human. And in order to do that, he had to become human. And so Jesus entered into the body of a human being, born to a virgin, a miraculous birth, and so Jesus has experienced everything that you and I experience. Did Jesus cry? You bet he did. Did Jesus hurt emotionally? You bet he did. Did Jesus feel abandoned? Did Jesus uh, feel despair? Did Jesus feel frightened? Did Jesus experience joy? Did, did Jesus experience? Yes, he did. Did Jesus experience physical pain? You bet he did. Did Jesus experience temptation? You bet he did. Maybe not in the way that we do. I'm not saying that Jesus considered, well, maybe I ought to do this bad thing. But the bad thing was at least presented to him. And so he experienced everything that you and I experience. And so there's nothing that we cannot bring to Jesus. There's nothing that we would bring and he would say, I'm sorry, I can't relate. I can't understand. He's experienced all of it, which makes him our perfect high priest. And so he was fully God and fully man. And being fully man is so important because when Jesus was nailed to that cross, he was nailed to the cross in a human body that had nerve endings. And he experienced the fullness of the suffering upon that cross. Subject to the law. That yes, Jesus too had to honor and follow the Ten Commandments. And not only the Ten, but the 613. And He did it absolutely perfectly. He never once sinned. And God sent Him to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law. God sent Jesus to buy something. Right? You and I were slaves to the law. You and I are, are broken. As I said a few moments ago, every one of us deserves to go to hell. And I know some of you are like, man, that's harsh. I'm not that bad. Romans tells us that every one of us deserves hell. And yet God sent Jesus to buy us back. Like there was a cost. He had to pay for it. And he paid with his life. And then this is amazing. So that he could adopt us. Do 
Jesus came into the world and he gave his life and died on a cross, paying for our sins so that, whenever you see so that in scripture, you should get ready to underline, highlight, or circle. He did it so that you and I could be sons and daughters of the living God. Sons and daughters in our right relationship. Sons and daughters who are beloved and cherished and delighted in and sung over. Have you noticed who did all the work so far? God's done it all. He's done all the work so that He could adopt us. How desperately, how bad did God want you that He did all the work to make you His son or His daughter? And because we are His children, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. I think sometimes we forget, at least some of us, that the Holy Spirit of the living God resides inside of each one of us. The Holy Spirit, who is not only the giver of life, but the giver of wisdom, the giver of insight, the giver of powers that, that are beyond us. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside us and guide us and lead us. Hold on to that word. We're going to talk, if I ever get to the, the real sermon today, about <laughs> leading We cry out, Abba, Father. And I've heard different uh, preachers preach on Abba, Father. Some of them are going to tell you, Abba, Father is Daddy. Daddy. And, and, and that's cool. I like that because I, I like the idea of when, when kids are really little and, and they call you Daddy. Because there's something like they, they, they just love you and respect you and honor you and admire you and, and they just delight in you. And that's when you're Daddy. But then there are other preachers who have said, no, no, we've misunderstood that term. That term is actually a, a term of respect and honor. In Middle Eastern cultures, Abba, Father, is a respect of honor. And I like to think that it's both with God. There's honor and there's reverence and there's respect, but there's also Daddy. Can I just put my arms out and hug you? Now you are no longer slaves, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God made you his heir. What does it mean to be an heir? To be an heir is to be the one who will receive everything that my father has. Everything that belongs to my father also belongs to me. And this scripture says that everything that belongs to our Father in heaven, all of it belongs to you and to me. And it's not just the stuff. It's not just the cattle on a thousand hills. It's not just that the meek will inherit the earth. Because quite frankly, I don't want it. But righteousness, peace, power, Love, perfect love. I'm so glad I'm an heir of those things. That's what Christmas is really about. Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> We read this last week, starting at the beginning. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men came from eastern lands and they arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. And we have come to worship him. You know, we talked about how these wise men, they were Gentiles. They weren't Jewish people. They weren't Israelites. They weren't Gentiles from, from some foreign land. We think possibly uh, from the land of Babylon, and we talked about why, but they were, they were Gentiles who knew very little about the Messiah. And yet these wise men were curious. They had a curiosity. They, they were curious about scientific things. They were curious about cultural things. They were curious about spiritual things. And brothers and sisters, don't we live in a world today where people are still curious? 
People are curious. Whether they will acknowledge it or not, they are curious about spiritual things. I mean, philosophers for centuries, even millennia, have tried to answer the most essential and basic questions that, that human beings have. Why are we here? What does it all mean? What is this all about? Right? Philosophers have been trying to answer that question for centuries. Uh, th there's the invention in every civilization of, of idols and, and, and fake gods. There's, there's the invention in every civilization of, of these religions. And so people are indeed curious, and they're trying to create answers for the questions that are inside all of us. And in this case, for these wise men, God used a light to lead them. Now hear this. He used a light in the sky to lead them to the light of the world. God used a light in the sky to lead them to the light of the world. And this story that we see in Matthew, in fact, my message today is about leading people to the light of the world. We'll continue on in that, that story. Verse 3, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. You know, what's interesting about this is that even Herod, even this king, was curious. He may not always have been curious, but when these wise men showed up and they asked, where is the star of the newborn king? Cur uh, Herod became curious. He said, well, what, what, what do we know about this newborn king? Where is this newborn king supposed to come from? I'd like to know. And so there's a, a curiosity even in Herod. You also recognize that the leading priests and the teachers of relig religious law, at some point they were curious as well. They were either curious enough to study in advance, or when they were asked this question, they were curious enough to go to the scriptures and find the answer because they quote Micah 5. And so there is a curiosity here. And then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them that the, the time when the star first appeared... And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, the apprehension. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, the anxiety, the stress, the fear, whatever it was that these teachers, the, the Bible folks, imagine the apprehension they had when Herod, who's known for slaughtering people, when he asks the question, there's a new king? Uh, what can you tell me about this new king? I, I, I'd like to know about this new king. And they have to tell him the answer that, yeah, there, there is a new king and he'll be born in Bethlehem. And the wise men also have to share this with Herod. And so I'm sure there was some level of fear. I'm sure there was some level of, of apprehension over sharing the truth about Jesus. Maybe that resonates with you. I don't know. And nevertheless, they spoke the truth. They declared what they knew to be true about Jesus. And to do so, they shared the Scriptures. Verse 9. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so here what we see again is that the star guided them. The star pointed. The star led them to the light of the world. The star pointed them to Jesus. I don't know why I said them. It pointed them to Jesus. Now 
And isn't that our purpose? Right, we're talking about a series where it's called, it's not Be Caster, by the way, it's Be a Star. I don't know if anyone else saw that. You're like, you're looking at that, oh, Be Caster. Be a star. Be a star. We're trying to find ways that we can be like this star. And last week we talked about how the star, it moved toward Jesus. It didn't just stand still. It wasn't content to just stand. It moved toward Jesus. And we talked about how followers of Christ have to move. If you're not moving, you're not following. You're a Christ stander. You want to be a follower of Christ. And so we move toward Jesus. And this week what we're talking about is as we move toward Jesus, one of the things we do is we point to Jesus. We lead others to Jesus. So the star led them. By the way, imagine how Joseph and Mary may have wondered. Right? There's a part of this story where uh, God comes to Joseph in a dream, and he says, hey, first thing, Joseph, like you can still marry Mary. I know you have some questions about how all this went down, and was she faithful, and what all that means. You can actually marry her, but in addition to that, you all need to get up and hightail it out of town. There's a bad thing coming, and you guys need to leave. Right now, one of the things we know about Joseph is that he was a craftsman, he was a carpenter, that he came from a, a low family. We know that Mary also came from a humble family. None of them really had much money, they weren't wealthy. And so if you're a, a, uh, a, a, a fiancé, you're, you're an engaged couple, you don't really have money, your, your, your uh, fiancé is pregnant, and now you've got to get up and hightail it out of town, like, how are you going to pay for this trip? How are you going to pay for your accommodations? Like, how is all that going to work? And last week we talked about possible symbolism in those gifts, and I don't know if it's right or not. I just know that over the years, theologians have talked about the symbolism of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. If you weren't here, the gold, symbolic that Jesus is a king. The, the, the frankincense uh, was for the, the priestly part of Jesus. Uh, it was like incense being uh, poured into the church. And the myrrh, of course, would be for embalming him after he died. Again, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but here's something that's really cool. If, if these wise men come and they give you gifts of gold, which is valuable, and frankincense, which is valuable, and myrrh, which is valuable, all three of which, by the way, are highly transportable, and then God says, hey, I need you to get up and take a journey. And you're wondering, but how am I going to afford this? How am I going to pay for it? And, and yet God's already made the provision. He's already made the provision. And I know this is like a totally separate message. It's like a message within a message. But heck, I did that with Galatians, so I'm going to do it again. I don't know if any of you are feeling today like you're wondering where your provision's going to come from. If you're feeling like, man, there's something I need. There, there's something going on. And I don't know how God's going to fix this. And I'll just be honest with you and tell you that I got one of those right now. Maybe some of you have one too. I know that Terry and Brett have one. I know that there are other families who have one. And you're wondering, Where's my provision going to come from? I just want to tell you today that God's always several steps ahead of us. He's always several steps ahead of us. And so do you have a situation today in which you're wondering where your provision will come from, where your rest will come from, where your rent is going to come from, where your business is going to get supplies in this jacked up supply chain, where your healing is going to come from, where your relational restoration is going to come from, where your prodigal child's awakening is going to come from, where will your peace come from? So I did a little search. I'm pretty lucky that I, I have a, a, a Bible Google. It's not what it's called. But, but the church uh, affords us here a, a Bible type of a search engine. So I did a little search here on passages that would remind us that God goes before us. And honestly, in my ignorance, and I'm just reminding you, I'm just like you guys. I really am. So some of you think like, oh, if you don't go up there and talk, you must know a lot of the Bible. Not really. You just know what you're talking about this week. <laughs> and so I was thinking of the song. And so I hit the like Bible Google thing. And I was like, all right, Bible passage for you go before us, behind us. Da, 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 da. You know that song, right? And um, the, the Google machine, this thing came back and it was like, first of all, you're an idiot. 
That passage is not in the Bible, but what is in the Bible are passages about God going before us. Just that piece of it. And I'm going to give you two today, just two. Deuteronomy 31.8. Deuteronomy 31.8. And remember, this is in the context of, God, I feel like there is something going on in my life, and I don't know where the provision is going to come from. I feel like you're telling me to go to Egypt, but I don't know how I'm going to pay for that, God. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And even though there were 27 of these, I'm just going to give you one more. Isaiah 45, 2. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. This is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the mountains. I will smash down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. You may remember we talked about that a few weeks ago. What mountain stands before you today? What bronze gates feel like they are locked closed before you today and you're wondering, God, how are you going to provide in this situation? And all I can tell you is that God's already gone before you. He's already knocked that mountain down and he's already smashed those gates. And his answer awaits you. And I love that I see that in the fact that God provided gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I've always wondered, like, why? Why is it even in the story? What strange gifts, right? Why do we even read about that? And it makes sense to me now because this family was going to have to travel and they needed some sort of currency. And now they had the means. And God was steps ahead of them. Verse 12 of Matthew 2. When it was time to leave, they, being the wise men, returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Well, you and I know that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. And in fact, he ended up killing all the baby boys. And so God let, uh, told these wise men, he led them in a different direction. He said, don't go back to Jerusalem, don't report to Herod, and he led them by a dream in a different direction. A couple things as we close here, we, we think about this story from a different perspective today. Can I just ask you to consider how far God will go to reveal himself to each one of us. See, I don't know all your stories. Last week I shared with you my story, and I know that many of you have been sharing your stories with one another. I hope we come to a day where we all get to know each other's stories. Maybe there's a, a way that we can do that. We'll have to think, think that through. But how far will God go to reveal himself to each one of us? And it's not just how far he'll go, but consider the ways that God spoke to the different people in the Christmas story. Although we haven't talked much about it, you'll remember that God spoke to the shepherds. Remember the shepherds? God spoke to the shepherds, and these were, these were Jewish boys who would have grown up knowing the scriptures. They would have known the prophecies. And so when God spoke to them to say that the Christ child is born, he spoke to them by sending an angel. Because Jewish boys who knew the scriptures would listen to an angel. I'm not sure that a wise men from Babylon would have, would have recognized or understood an angel. And so to them, the wise men, God sent a star. And the star led these astronomers. To Joseph, Jesus' father, and to the wise men alike, God sent a dream. <laughs> To the leading priests and teachers of religious law, God sent the scriptures, Micah 5. You'll remember that God led Abraham into a new land and a new life. God led the Israelites through Moses. God led the Israelites into right relationships through the law. And, and, and when we talk about that, the law, right? God gave the law to the people. And I just preached on uh, Thursday night to uh, uh, the center, our, our, our youth partnership in Joliet. 
and uh, preached a different message to them. But when we talked about the law, I, I had to remind them that when God delivered the law, He was delivering something good, right? This wasn't a, group, a, a list of rules for people to follow. It wasn't a list of rules like, okay, I'm going to give you these rules, you've got to follow them, don't break them, let's make things harder for you, let's make life more boring. It wasn't about that at all. What God was doing is He was saying, I want people to live in right relationships. Right relationships with me, so I'm going to give you the first ten, that's how you live in right relationship with me. That's the moral law. And then I'm going to give you 603 other ones. And that's how you live in right relationship with one another. And that's how you have harmony together. It's how you love one another and care for one another. It's how people become a peaceful, unified community. And so God prov provided the law is something good to help people live in right relationships. And then when the rest of the nation would see the Jewish people the way it was supposed to work, is people would say, wow, look at them. Look how they love each other. Look how they're blessed. Look how they're safe. Look at how the Jewish people live. And why is it? And the answer would be because they live in accordance with God's will. And so God used the law to lead those people, although they jacked it up pretty bad, and I would be critical of them, except that I jack it up too. God led his people through the judges, King David, King Solomon, the prophets. And brother or sister, hear this. If you hear nothing else today, look at me now. God is using you and me to lead lost people to the light of the world, to Jesus. Yes. If you've been around here any period of time, you've heard me talk about this before. There really isn't any reason for me to remain on this earth apart from leading others to Jesus. Like, I've already chosen Christ. I've already decided I'm laying my life down, Jesus. I want your forgiveness. I'm making you the king and the Lord of my life, and I'm doing it imperfectly, but I want to follow you, and I'm receiving your mercy. I'm receiving your forgiveness for my sins because of what you did at the cross, and so I will never, ever get better than I am now because the Scripture says I am today perfect. I am righteous. I am holy because Jesus' blood is painted over me, so I'm not going to get better better so there's no point for me to be here and work at getting better and this world is filled with pain and hardship and all kinds of things right wouldn't it be better for me to just go back up to heaven and be with God like wouldn't that be the best thing for me and so again you've heard me say this many times so why am I still here why are you still here why doesn't God just beam us up like Star Trek and take us immediately to heaven the moment that we accept Christ as Savior? And the reason is because you and I have work to do. We are now called to lead others, to be like that star and point others to Jesus, to lead others to the light of the world. Consider 2 Corinthians 5 with me as I begin to close here. Starting in verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God. Talking about the gospel. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. You have an assignment. You have a mission. You have a task. You have a job. You have instructions. And they come from the Father himself. To reconcile people to him. Verse 19. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Again, I say praise the Lord. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. He gave the message to you and to me, to his church, to his people, to his followers. Maybe not to his standers, but to his followers. Verse 20, so we are Christ's ambassadors. That means we're his representatives. We speak on his behalf. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is the reason.
reason why our small groups have been working on these different evangelism tools and strategies and, and, and all uh, testimonies and, and, and all these different things is not so that we could share them in our groups, not so that we could uh, pat each other on the back, but so that we would become ready to share with the world. And one of the things about this particular season is that the world seems just a little bit more receptive to our message. And so there's all kinds of phrases and cliches like strike while the iron's hot and take advantage of the opportunity and seize the day. And I don't know what kind of phrase you want to use, but I do know this. We often pray that God would open a door. We pray that God would make an opportunity. Brothers and sisters, this is it. We've got a chance right now to declare Jesus, to share the gospel, to be the ambassadors for Christ that we've been called to be. Sean, I'm going to ask you to come up here right now, if you will. Can you just grab your guitar? We're going to do something a little bit different this morning, right before I close. So often in church, we talk about what you should do. We try to encourage and motivate you to do. Very rarely do we give the opportunity to do. So I've asked Sean if he would just grab his guitar, and play about three or four minutes of music for us. And I'm going to shut up. And for the next three or four minutes... I'd love for every one of us to be thinking about the people, and you know you have them, and I do too. The people that we truly want to see come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. They may be sitting here in this room. They may be your family, your friends, your co-workers. But whoever they are, take the next three or four minutes, and if you want to pray silently by yourself, you do that. If you want to go grab somebody and tell them you're praying with me, you do that too. And it's okay in church sometimes to make somebody else feel uncomfortable. But for the next three or four minutes, let us be a people who would be focused on the ones that God would have us to lead to the light of the world and ask God to make those opportunities, to prepare those places, to open up those conversations.
couple of practical things we can do to help put people near the truth of Jesus. One of the things is we've been talking about, invite your family and friends to come to the Christmas Eve Eve services. Again, I can never promise that sermons are going to be great sermons. I don't know what a great sermon looks like, but I can tell you this. I promise you I will declare the truth that we are all sinners in need of a Savior, that his name is Jesus, that he died on a cross and rose from the dead, and that he will forgive those who follow him. And so invite your family and friends to come and, and worship with us. Pray and plan. Pray and plan. Pray and plan for God to present spiritual conversations with the people you love. And look, we don't know which opportunity will be our last opportunity. Right? Many of you know Brett Erickson's situation. Almost our whole church has been praying for the Erickson family. And Brett went off to do a job. Traveled to do a job. And without any warning whatsoever, with no indication whatsoever, is fighting for his life. And his family and his church are fighting for his life. He didn't know that was coming. I will say this. Praise God that Brett is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, one day Brett will be with the Lord. Sooner or later. And I praise God for it. But what about the people in our families who are not followers? And what if today is the day that they will be fighting for their lives? See, we don't know. And I don't know if we live with that kind of urgency. And it's hard, honestly, to, to just remain in that kind of urgency that, man, every day could be the last day. And yet somehow we have to understand that this is not just like a belief system. It's not just ethereal. This is the only thing that really matters because there's nothing else in this world that we'll take with us. There's nothing else we'll accomplish that will matter except for what we believe to be true about Jesus. And that's also for the people we love. Hey, speaking of Brett, um, our, we're asking the church if you would pray about and respond to the Lord's prompting if he so leads you to contribute to the financial needs of the Erickson family. So what we call this in church is a love offering. And so uh, I asked Jordan to bring a, a basket up here, but he's downstairs teaching. We'll locate that basket. But today and next Sunday and any time in between during office hours, if you feel compelled, uh, you can make a, a financial contribution to the Erickson family. And I can't share all of the details, especially by virtue of the fact that we're on the Internet right now, but I can tell you a couple of things. One thing is, is this. Um, Terry is currently staying with Brett in his room. Uh, she doesn't really want to leave his side, and yet that's not totally practical. Uh, there are things like using the bathroom. There are things like taking a shower, right? And sometimes even just for your own personal uh, sanity, you, you need to get a, a short break. And so for her to have a place where she can go and not have to change every other day and go from this hotel to that hotel to that hotel, uh, there are those pieces. There are some things uh, with regard to getting family down to Florida or back again. And, and there's just lots of financial pieces to this thing. And so if you feel compelled uh, to give, uh, we would ask you to, to do that. And again, we're not arm twisters here. We're not into making people feel guilty. Uh, we believe that the Lord will convict you. And this church has always been incredibly generous in these situations. And... Um, Again, I have to be careful how much I share, but I will say this. Remember that Brett was a small, is a small business owner. And uh, while his business has had seasons of success, there are also seasons of uh, slowdown. And this season is traditionally a season of slowdown uh, for, for Brett's family, uh, for his business, I should say. And uh, so there are folks there, too, whose lives are going to be impacted uh, even if, if just for this short time of Brett's illness. So that I would ask you to be thinking about and praying about uh, the folks at his business too because they're being impacted as well. And um, 
Yeah, rather than drone on, I think I'll just say, pray about it. See what the Lord leads you to, and if, if he leads you to be generous, uh, let's do that. Let's rally around and, and support a brother and a sister. If you have more specific questions, you can come and talk to me, and, and I'll share as much as I can. Uh, but we'll make that basket available in the foyer, and then again, it'll be available next Sunday and during business hours this week. Pastor. Yes, question? Can yeah, you can. I don't know. I heard you say this morning that your uh, carol that you like, here, well, I don't know if people can hear you, buddy. And I don't know if God has any connection to that, but I have been playing carols all these you gotta talk into the mic. Like last two weeks, and uh, it, this particular carol is stuck in my brain, and I've been playing it over and over. And uh, But I love the old carols. Yeah, the old Christmas carols? Yes, the old Christmas carols, but... I don't know if it's any connection to this, but you said your holy night you like, and I've been playing the different ones, but this one keeps coming back to me, and I keep playing it over and over. Is that old holy night? Old holy night. All right. Well, maybe we'll uh, make an opportunity next week where you can play it for us. No, I'll do that. All right. All right, church, let me close with this and invite the worship team up as they're going to lead us out. Um, I think of those wise men who had to tell Herod that there's a newborn baby. I think of those uh, Bible teachers, and I think of those experts in the religious law, and how Herod had the question, and they had to answer his question and tell him that, yes, there is a newborn king. And I think about the apprehension. I think about the anxiety, the fear, the hesitation, the nervousness, all those things. And I think that we can relate because many of us have felt those same things when it comes to sharing our faith with others. And yet, as I said earlier, that's really our sole purpose as believers. I know there are other things we're supposed to do, but our sole purpose is to be the ambassadors who are telling others about Jesus Christ. And it is good news. If there's anything we should be happy to share with others, it would be good news. And this is the good news. And if it's hard to do that, invite them to church. If it's hard to do that, invite them into your small group. If it's hard for you to do that, then maybe just do this. If nothing else, just find as many ways as you possibly can to declare the name of Jesus. Just simply add Jesus to your conversations. Just say Jesus, because i got to tell you, it's a beautiful name. You might even say, Jesus, what a powerful name it is. Guess what song we're going to sing? <laughs> let's stand and sing together, but let's sing it as if it's true.